And welcome back to Fully Equipped. And after last week's podcast, all everybody wants to talk about is Uncle Gene, sunsets, opera, and underwear. <laughs> you know what? It's, there's, there's part of me that just wants to talk about it some more too, but hey, you know what? If you didn't hear one of the greatest bits of Fully Equipped podcast history, go back and listen to episode 233 of Fully Equipped. By the way, if you want to watch us, and you want to see our reactions to this whole ordeal? Go back and uh, check out our fully equipped YouTube page. I'm gonna, I'm gonna haul, off. I'm gonna haul my laptop out to my <laughs> patio, and I'm gonna film live from the sunset Please next don't. week. How about that? Oh gosh. <laughs> anyway, go go check out the episode. We we are recording all of them live on the YouTube page. Yes, this one is also at live s- at sunset. By the way, West Coast yeah, time. Everyone's- once again, sunset. Yes, I know. Thank, thank you, Uncle Gene. Anyway, with that, as always, boys, how are we doing? Fantastic. I mean, I wish there was more golf like right now. We just got so teased. It got so teased a couple weeks ago, playing out in like a t-shirt, basically 60 something degrees and snow three days ago. One of the biggest dumpings of snow we've had all year, of course. But other than that, life is pretty good. Uncle Gene is is very quiet right now. Yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm in an existential crisis right now. Um, oh Lord, here we go. Getting this rival re- last week's kind of close. I'm reading this book by Robert Sapolsky, and he's a he's a um, he's a professor at Stanford, and he's written this book called Determined. And basically, the book the essence of the book is that free will is an illusion that we have no free will, that we're made up of 30 trillion cells and not one of them has free will or consciousness and that our body <laughs> is tricking us and this whole concept and construct that we have of consciousness is just an illusion in order for us to uh, function. And it's really been throwing me because I watched Oppenheimer on Friday night and it is, if anyone has not yet seen it, it is well worth seeing. It is mind boggling, but I'm just really struggling with this free will as an illusion. And what's the point of all this, but I won't get into that too deeply because this is oh, a cool what's, what's this, this sounds I mean, like, gonna, this sounds like a, if he's a professor, he sounds like a tenured press professor of like, how much weed can you smoke? No, no. The, the take is what's interesting is they have the ability now through neurobiology to measure so you, they tell you to go push a button and you go to push the button, your brain sometimes almost a second earlier signals you to push the button before your conscious self realizes that you are supposed to push that button. And so this is evidence that our bodies are basically telling, giving these signals that create consciousness when they've already decided before we actually make the decision. So you're telling me when I buy that that driver online and I click the buy button, I, I, I mean, I was going to do it anyway. So. Well, I mean, here's the deal. If you buy into the Siri, who gives a rat's ass? I mean, everything's been predetermined anyway. So buy the damn driver, you know, okay, take can, the trip. Can somebody- can somebody tell me which driver is gonna gonna help me shoot the lowest scores? Is that is that possible? Let's look into the future and and, well, and see which one I should stick with with for you know three to five years. And it's ultimately what it is that he comes down to is we're just a function of our biology. We're just a function of you know, I mean we're a function of our parents, our grandparents, etc. And then we're a function of environment and both of those things together. But if you can identify everything in the environment and everything biologically, then you can absolutely predict the future because it's, it's just based on a, on a cellular level. So anyways, it's, I find, it's, this, well, I find cell, this shit at so this point, my, Most of the cells in my body are comprised of a lot of pizza. So <laughs> that could, that could be predetermining the future. <laughs> that you will be consuming more pizza. <laughs> I will be consuming more pizza at some point in my life. You know, he probably oh wouldn't argue against that point. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyways, very, man, very so. fair, and uh, and welcome to fully equipped. Uh, anyway, all right. Well, now that we got that out of the way, let's. You let's, asked. Let's, yeah, I know. I did ask. I'm glad I asked. That was that was a fun way to kick it off. But 
something else that came across the newswire last week after the pod dropped. And this is all right. So let, let's just get right into it. Then, then I'll, then I'll give my initial take. So last week, South Korea's Chosun Daily, it's a newspaper. They reported, and they were the only one to report. And then a bunch of us, including, uh, myself and RB head at golf.com that Callaway was going to be spun off from top golf and sold. There you go. That's, that was, that was the story. So, and I think everybody by now is aware that, that if you, it's Callaway, yes, but it, it's the official name. If you look at it on, on the ticker is top golf Callaway. So Callaway acquired top golf. They changed the name to top golf Callaway uh, they've got a whole bunch of other um, other businesses underneath the umbrella. Uh, you've got Travis Matthew, Jack Wolfskin, OGO, uh, also Top Golf, clearly. Um, guys, this is an interesting one because you know I, I like to I like to make sure that we're the ones reporting the news and not not somebody else. That nobody else out there, nobody else out there was reporting this. I mean, other outlets, and I mean, Bloomberg, so if you want to add a little bit of validity to the report, Bloomberg picked up on it, and they they ran with the story too. But, you know, it this it, it kind of started to come out. We reached out to Callaway. Callaway issued a statement, and I, I have to be honest, I was really surprised that Callaway issued a statement. I kind of figured that they'd be quiet. But they said in their statement, while it is our long-standing practice not to respond to market rumors and speculation in light of today's unusual market activity, coupled with a recent media report originating in Korea regarding discussions of a potential sale of the company or its golf equipment business, we can confirm that we are not aware of any such discussions. We do not intend to comment any further on this topic, and we assume no obligation to make any further announcement or disclosure should circumstances change. Um, I, I mean, let's, let's just open it up. Like, what are you, what are your thoughts? Like off the cuff? What, what did you think when you heard that there was a possibility, at least through this report that Callaway was going to be spun off from top golf and sold? I think, I mean, when, when no, no offense, I mean, I obviously like people can't just go out there and like blindly say like, Oh yeah, this is definitely happening. And you know, they can't do that from a communication standpoint. Um, just the same way that like uh, Tiger Woods was going to not have a clothing deal with TaylorMade and then Sunday Red comes out, right? Like people sign all of these agreements and they don't talk about these things in public for many number of reasons. The same reason Jay Monahan doesn't go around to press conferences, no offense to him at the players last week, but he can't come out and speculate, right? Like people, you know, he's not a great public speaker, but he comes out and he's like, oh, well, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about that. And it's like, well, I, I kind of get it. Like that's your job. You're not, there to speculate to the public about things that are going on behind the scenes. Like you just can't do it. And I think in this case, it's one of those, it's like, look, if there's smoke, there's fire. It's obviously like a report that came out of somewhere. And if based on what they're saying, it makes, I mean, it makes sense if you think about, which I think is interesting. Now this would potentially put um, Callaway in with Titleist and TaylorMade as companies that, or as equipment, hard good manufacturers, or uh, whatever companies, however you want to like call it, they're not they're not the original suppliers, but that would put them under like South Korean ownership. And if we know anything about the golf industry in Asia, South Korea and Japan drive that market by like an insane amount. And Japan is an interesting uh, place right now from an economy perspective because they have an aging population that they really haven't gained anything there. But like. Um, South Korea, they, they are a huge growing, we are seeing so many brands go over there and open up flagship stores and open up all kinds of different experiences for golfers. And if Cali wants to sell off all of their, um, like the hard goods side or top golf wants to sell off the hard goods side, the manufacturing side of equipment, like it makes sense because top golf makes a ton of money. Top golf is just, like it, it is making a lot of money. So why not invest in the technology side of your business and sell off the hard good side, which means like inventory and all of these other things that you have that are, are a lot more difficult to control. 
the the thing that I don't understand about it, and yeah, I I I agree with your analysis, but the thing that I don't understand about it is, you know, Top Golf and Callaway to me are symbi- symbiotic in that you know, what's the, what's the percentage of golfers that go to top golf that are non golfers? I mean, that's a huge potential market and you've got the growth potential of top golf. Number one, that adds to the bottom line of the publicly traded company. But number two, you have top golf as a potential driver of revenue, i.e. new customers coming into the game. And so it seems like by spinning off Callaway alone, mm-hmm. Um, you lose all of the advantages of having Callaway and Top Golf combined. So I, I don't, I mean, unless you know, I, 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 I'm not an expert in Asian distribution of American golf equipment, but I'm guessing that it's pretty well entrenched. You know, if maybe they saw a play that they could grow the Asian influence, but Callaway is a mature company and once again a publicly traded company, so I'm sure they have pretty good distribution deals in Asia. So what's the upside to buy them as a spinoff alone? That's that, that would be kind of my take. I, I haven't heard any, um, you know, kind of arguments or even suggestions as to what the benefit would be for the South Koreans. Other than just yeah. to control everything in the golf industry. Well, I'll say, yeah, other than, other than to control the, the th- three of the biggest OEMs in the industry. Um, one of the interesting things that that I go back to is, you know, Callaway has invested a lot of money in Chicopee, Chicopee, Massachusetts. They That's where they have their ball plant. Um, a lot of money into R&D and quality control and tolerances you know, my thing is, is why, like, why do that? I mean, I guess maybe it makes you more appealing to a potential buyer if you have it, but like, why spend the money? I, I think Callaway, like the name alone, if you were going to try and spin it off from Top Golf and sell it, I don't think you need to, I don't think you need to like spruce it up by, by investing, you know, millions and millions of dollars in a ball plant and new technology there. And, and if you look at, at what Chip Brewer, and we got to get to discuss Chip, who is the CEO of Callaway, you know, he said in their, in their recent quarterly meeting that the, the Callaway Chrome Tour golf balls, you know, they're, they're promoting sales and the trial of the new golf ball through Top Golf. And they said their goal is 200,000 new users coming specifically from Top Golf. I mean, they're investing pretty heavily in the golf ball, I feel like more than anything else. And it's just, it's like there's this disconnect between, like, again, I go back to why why spend all this money to, to then have this idea of where you want to take the golf ball and, and the number of people that you're trying to convert from Top Golf into, into actual golfers that are going to be playing your golf ball. I mean that's that's a lot to be doing, and and I know the the flip side here is that Callaway. If you look at what's and this is again this is the inside baseball that only we talk about. If you look at what's been going on at Callaway, they have they have lost some key people. Uh, Doctor Alan Hocknell, who is uh, you know in, in my opinion was the the driver of the R and D department at Callaway is now a Titleist. You also have Roger Cleveland, who I, I was told he's going to still be doing um, corporate events for Callaway, at least a set number, but he's now he's now moved on and is now <laughs> going to be uh, a consulting on on a new shaft company. So And let's not forget Austy, Austy yeah, um, yep, Rollinson. Yep, like and, he, yep, he was from Odyssey, yeah. works for Titleist and Scotty Cameron now. Yep. Yep. So they've, so that you're exactly right. That they've lost three key people. And so it it does make you wonder why, why did three of the most influential people at at Callaway move around the exact same time? You know, I've, I've spoken to Osti. I saw him at Riviera. He's, he's doing great at Scotty Cameron loves working with Scotty. Um, you know, I, I think for the most part, the the response has been just just the change of scenery, but it, it is it does one of those things that makes you think. 
Well, Osti, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, he, I think, was a um, – he got swept up in in those initial COVID layoffs. And, and you know, it was kind of interesting. Callaway was the first ones when COVID hit, like a month, month and a half later, they, they laid off a lot. They didn't lay off Allen, but they laid off a lot of top executives because – they like everybody thought golf was over, not that golf was about to explode. And so they cut a lot of positions to tighten the belt. And Osti, um, unfortunately was one of those. And so he went, did some consulting on his own for a while and then, and then came back and got the gig with, with Scotty. But, um, you know, that was just a retrenchment on Callaway's part because they, they, saw the world shutting down and didn't think there was going to be a market for golf equipment. Um, you well, know, they, they also of- had Sean Toulon too. I mean, that, that yeah. was too, that I think Callaway at the time was trying to figure out how to, how to marry the brands of Odyssey and Toulon together, but you're exactly right. I think they just were, were, you know, starting to say, Oh man, what, what are we going to do? And we've already got Sean here. Uh, but still it, it, you're, you're right. It, it, it's not exactly a guy just up and leaving, but, I mean, it's, the Allen is, one's yeah. more interesting because there's been a lot of speculation as to that, as to if he could continue his research and stuff. And, you know, yeah, I'm not going to comment yeah. on hearsay, but just yeah. keep an eye for what he does at Titleist because there's some interesting rumors out uh, there. RB's that, already digging around in the in the patents. So Yeah. I think, well, uh, he, yeah. yeah, supposedly. <laughs> some cool, supposedly, some cool shit going on. Let's yeah. Supposedly. Out. Supposedly. Some he's Iron Man esque stuff. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we'll that see. Was, I think the, 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 the first time they actually put him out front was in the new finding feel um, documentary because there was a time with, um, with Harry Arnett and uh, Chad Coleman and AJ Papel. And like, that was like the crew that was like doing social media and being very out front. And they gave Alan a platform to like be out front and talk about technology. And then there was a time where they, you know, leadership as far as marketing and, and that changed with Callaway a little bit. And then Alan just kind of became more of like the backhand back uh, behind the scenes, research and development guy again. And, you know, like you see this shift from Titleist where they've really started pushing more of their like R and D people out into like these um, ways of coverage the same way that to be fair, a lot of OEMs are doing now, right? Like I think the serious golfers are really curious about what goes on behind the scenes. It's, it's, no different than I think in some ways it sounds, I just pulled this comparison out of thin air, which of course is very more of a me thing. Um, but it's kind of like celebrity chefs, right? Like people want to know like what goes into like what you're eating and those who are really into food are like curious about like the people behind it. And I think it's kind of the same thing where it's like, you know, these engineers over here, we know Thomas Loss, he's over at, at Cobra. He's been in the business for a long time. You've got the team at Titleist. You've got the team of Ping. Ping for a long time never put any of their engineers out front. And then they've got guys like Marty and and uh, Dr. Paul Wood and Eric Henrickson. Like they're putting people out front of from behind the scenes, which you don't really see. Um, and I think that was maybe like a bit of a shift from Callaway. They've really focused on the technology rather than a lot of the people. And they focused on players. And maybe now because of um, Rom. Right, Rom left, and they they really don't see him featured in stuff. Maybe they're looking around, going like, you know, this is a change for us, and maybe this is an opportunity to not not. I mean, cut bait. Like, I don't think they've obviously created a very successful company, but I think at some point, just like Chip Brewer got Adams to a point where it was like taking market share from people, and someone came in and said, "Let's buy you for I think it was like seventy five million dollars versus like the debt that they carried and all that stuff from TaylorMade." Maybe that's what they want to do with this, with like the hard good side of the business. And it, in a in a funny in a funny way, and I'm thinking of like a comparison sake here. Like billionaires in the United States, they love buying sports franchises, right? Every billionaire is like, who's good? like Mark Mark Cuban's like, I'm going to buy the Dallas Mavericks, and like all these people, like Steve Ballmer goes out and buys the Clippers, right? Like you got enough money, you just want to invest in something that like you love doing, and maybe because we know, um, like maybe maybe these people at like Korean private equity firms, are like, listen, man, we got enough money, we are buying a golf company. Cause that would seem pretty sweet. Yeah. It's, it's just, I don't, I don't know. The, the industry right now, I, I will say this. 
is is at a weird time. I I feel like we're we're due for a correction. And you know, that's that's probably the only that's probably my only reasoning for for why this would happen. Is is maybe maybe Callaway sees something coming down the road. I don't know. I just I, I look at I look at the like the price for for golf equipment out there, and I know look we we have this is a golf podcast. We talk about how great this tech is, and it is, and it costs money to make golf clubs. But it's just like wow. I I I talk to I talk to golfers all the time, and their one beef with the industry is that it's too expensive. And my 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 response is always, well, you can always go go buy some used gear, but <laughs> what do we always talk about on this podcast? Go get fit. So it's 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 sort of a it's sort of a tough spot to be in when you've got new stuff out there that's really expensive. You've got stuff that, you know that's been reduced by in price, and maybe you can find that stuff in in a in a club matrix and, and get with a fitter and, and get fit for that. But it just feels like we're due for a correction. Prices can't stay at these at these numbers, and we've already seen it. You know, at least now we're not having golf clubs backordered for months on end, year on end. Um, I know there are a few that are still having issues, but at least it feels like we're getting out of the the logistical stuff. But I don't know. Do do either you guys know? I, I haven't followed this do either you guys know what the like updated population of golfers is considered you know it, for years it was always 24 million that it was stuck at and i i just came across something the other day and it just stunned me and i don't know if it's true or not that's why i wanted to throw it out there i saw a number bandied about like 40 million you know that, that there had been this huge increase and you know a lot of these are quote unquote uh off off course golfers you know that identify themselves they go to you know either a simulator or, but do either of you know what that number is because that number will define you know a lot of this uh potential basically yeah so the the ngf the national golf foundation usually releases a report um so they have the basically three different types of participants in, in these groups. They have on course only, which was 12.1 million in 2023 off course only, which was 18.5 million. And those who engage on both fronts at 14.5 million. Well, that, tw- that, that 12, that 12, how does Sorry, that work? That 12%. Like, no, I mean, you don't add those all together, right? <laughs> that's what I've tried. That's what I've tried to figure out. So those who engage on both fronts, I'm guessing it's like the 12 million plus another another like two from the off course only, which is the 18. Um yeah. It's 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 a so okay, so <laughs> let me just put it this way. It's total on course compared to uh 2022 was let's see here it was up four percent and it's also the off course was also up so there's i mean sorry i'm i am like literally reading this as, as we're going i was, was not prepared I to be discussing oh i didn't, the, I didn't, oh, I didn't notice that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I can watch remember your, watching, OEM watching telling your me, mouth move while you were doing it. Yeah, the tale, tale I'm, just, I'm just, I'm guys. It's like I, I'm reading it as we go. <laughs> well, I mean, so, I, I, yeah. I, the, the, I mean, it's it's up. It's it's up. It's up compared to it's up compared to 22. Uh, but the off course, I think, is up 18 versus versus 22, 23 versus 22, and and again, like I said, for, up four percent versus 2022. So the the numbers are still trending up, but and I don't necessarily think that it's it's that we're gonna see fewer golfers. I just I just think that we saw this massive influx and we saw a lot of golfers that were new and that needed equipment and were just buying stuff. And and then there was like the COVID uh, headaches with the logistics and trying to get stuff from Asia and components and and all that. That that just absolutely made made for a ton of headaches. So, 
I don't know. I think we're just, I think, and maybe it's not a, a massive correction. Maybe it's just a, a leveling off. But I, again, I just can't see, I can't see stuff staying at these prices. It's just ridiculous. I look, I look at some of them and I'm like, oh my gosh, who's paying for, who's paying that? And a lot of like the limited edition stuff that's just crazy expensive too. Golf is an expensive sport, but it just feels like it's gotten more expensive in the last like four to five years. Oh, absolutely. What are drivers now? Five ninety nine. Yeah, I mean they've they've already broken the six the six bill threshold for wow. some of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's the the P, the PXG the new uh, the new Black Ops? I mean, that's that's I think it's over. 600. That's that's like six hundred, yeah, six hundred bucks. I think that the tour head is is six fifty. Like the regular black ops is five ninety nine ninety nine, but uh, I think those the tour that was like six hundred and fifty dollars. So yeah, there's there's some really expensive products out there. But hey, look what what, did, what performed really well when we went through our our driver testing. PXG. Well, you know, you <laughs> get what know, you pay for. Was, well, and it was interesting because I mean that's always been kind of the you know, if there was a criticism of PXG, it was always that their drivers didn't quite perform, you know, up to the same level as their irons did, you know, in the competition. And they really changed that script this year. And so uh, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if um, Brad and Nico, who were the designers at PXG, um, you know, went to Bob and said, Hey, we got to increase the cost of goods to make this thing work. And in doing so, you know, they came out with something that, you know, was, uh, was really interesting from a technology standpoint. Before we wrap on this topic, I, I do want to get, I want you to look into your crystal ball and tell me in the next year, what's going to happen with Callaway? Is it still going to be top golf Callaway or is Callaway going to be owned by somebody else? I say it will still be Top Golf Callaway for the reasons that you just laid out. That that's a, uh, I mean, it's tough to sell something when it's on the top, and Callaway's on the top. It's like, what are you buying it for? You know, it, it, you, how are you going to grow that? Versus if it stays with Top Golf, and Top Golf continues to expand, then Callaway can expand as well. So I, I, I just, I see them connected. I don't see, I see Callaway being a much weaker company standing alone than being with Topgolf. RB? I, I think they might, um, I feel like it's such a, it's, it's such a revenue driver, like together they are kind of symbiotic that um, they might bring someone in, but Lee, like not separate. I guess I don't know if they're looking for like an influx or something like that, just from like uh, to continue to expand Top Golf or something. But um, I don't know. I just again, I feel like there's something there, but these deals take a long time. These deals do take a long time, especially if you're going to separate a company. So I would imagine in, in 12 months it'd probably remain the same for now. Yeah, I, I'm I'm in agreement there. I don't think we're going to see any change. And it's again for for the points that I I made. I think they've made a lot of investments in golf ball, in the plant. Um, you can tell based on their their what they're saying in their quarterly comments. They're they're going all in on on Chrome Tour. So and I think that's tied to Top Golf and and trying to get some converts there. So yeah, I don't think we're going to see any change anytime soon. You know what we're all in on, Jonathan. And Gene, and hopefully some of those listeners out there, we're all, we're all in on inside golf. <laughs> there we go. Um, because here we go. If you, um, we, I know we've talked about it in the past, but we just we love to remind people about it. Um, you know, a couple weeks before the U.S. Open, we've got this big inside golf trip to Pinehurst. Now to join inside golf costs forty bucks, um, and this trip is a pretty exclusive trip. There's a dinner at um, the Dorna Cottage. There is, uh, which is where Donald Ross live off of Pinehurst number two, which is pretty sweet. Uh, golf at number eight, golf at number 10, golf at the Cradle, which is pretty sweet. Don't forget the Thistledew, the putting course that's there. That's also just, just free. You can just rock up and play that anytime you want. Uh, there's going to, there's a bunch of products that are included with the trip from uh, Strixon, which is, uh, we got some Cleveland wedges. We're going to have, um, Gary, uh, I almost said Gary Costas. 
<laughs> Beer Cost is Gary McCord. Uh, there's there's all kinds of stuff going on um, behind the scenes. Again, weeks before the U.S. Open at Piners, you're going to be able to walk Piners number two, get to see and get gain all of this inside knowledge for you get at home and sit on your couch and completely veg uh, to watch the U.S. Open at Piners, which I'm very excited for. And you can get more information about this. Head over to golf.com. Uh, look for Inside Golf. You can find the, the sign up there. And uh, there's just, I think, for those who are like absolutely into golf, it's an experience that cannot be missed. Uh, and uh, check it out at uh, okay, golf.com slash inside golf for the full access to the, uh, the and, that we've got planned. And I'll, and I'll tell you a little insight. If you want to get McCord excited, if you do go on this and both. Why, why are you Boston, doing this? Why why are you? You're, you're, you're just. Pumping them off. <laughs> you are. Ask. Ask McCord, ask oh. McCord about Bigfoot and aliens. He will why, go, why would you do that? So amazing. <laughs> His knowledge you know, of Bigfoot. <laughs> he actually belongs to the Vail Bigfoot Society, and they do events like Bigfoot and Fondue where they go out <laughs> searching for Bigfoot. It is so awesome to talk to him about Bigfoot. I mean, that's you're just going to get him talking about Bigfoot for an hour. That is worth the trip in and of itself is just go out there and, uh, and yeah. And ask him about Bigfoot. And then there's Peter Costas, who's like one of the greatest minds of teaching and breaking down swings, but McCord and Bigfoot and UFOs. Oh my goodness. It is. I should say (laughs) if you're not into Bigfoot either, I can't also forget that, the the USGA going to get an inside look at their their equipment, their Hall of Fame that's there. You get all kinds of stuff that's going to be opening up just before the U.S. Open. It includes a stay at the Carolina Hotel. It's it's a whole experience. It doesn't have to include Bigfoot. Um, I've never seen him around the the North Carolina like Sand Hills there. You there, um, but uh, yeah, don't forget because Gene's got a robot at the USGA testing site there, and uh, you'll get to see it there. So if you've never seen one in person, it's kind of pretty sweet. Oh, and and all I want to do is talk don't about. Forget, yeah, don't forget also, Bigfoot. Say it, that's all I want. I just want. I just want McCord to talk about Bigfoot. That's it. Well, it, well, RB had a hat. Was that Bigfoot with a golf club that you had on that hat? Is a is a Bigfoot carrying a golf bag. Yeah, that's it's the it's the it's one of the hats like I get asked about all the time. Uh, it's from True Links Wear. So, yeah, it's Asquatch carrying a set of clubs. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh man. Speaking of sets right. of clubs, we know what we should yeah. talk about. Yes, please. Yeah, let's let's get us back on topic here. <laughs> Thank you, RB. Peter Malnati, who is like king of the average guy on tour, the man with the bucket hat, the yellow golf ball, the to be fair, not very good driving statistics. I and mean, he played pretty well uh, this past week. Um, he's kind of like the everyman on the PGA Tour. People joke, you know, he's like the king of the mules. Uh, uh, you hear that all? You know, hear it from a number of podcasts uh, that you probably listen to if you listen to this. And I think my favorite meme that I saw is that the next, uh, the next pack meeting was, it was Alec Baldwin from the uh, coffee is for closers. And it was like, Cantlay's over there getting coffee and, and, and Peter Malnati's um, Alec Baldwin. And he goes, coffee is for closers. Get away from there. Because he's obviously one more recently than Cantlay, which I thought was very good. Um, but Speaking of his clubs, other than his yellow Pro V1 golf ball, or Pro V1 X golf ball, I want to make sure we get the, the right golf ball there. Um, he played the T200, the T150, and the T100. And I can remember at the end of last year taking pictures of his bag, which I was trying to find. I'm sure I got it somewhere like stored on my computer that I'm staring into right now in some file or wherever. But at one point, he is also testing the T300 or 350, right? So – like this man does not care what his clubs look like. He is focused on what they're designed to do throughout the bag. And especially too, like I thought it was the most interesting because I originally thought like, okay, well he plays the T 200. He probably just goes right to the one fifties all the way through, but he just has the single one fifty. I believe it was the five iron. And then it just goes six to pitching wedge of the T 100. So I was like, this is a man who just doesn't care what how it works, like how it looks. He just wants it to work and find his distances. And after the last win of the 2015 Sanderson, earned himself a nice little paycheck, guaranteed himself in some signature events. Pretty cool to see. And obviously he was emotional about uh, about winning, right? He knows it's hard and it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. I 
it kind of for for all the the reasons that RB just pointed out there, it, you know, we we talk about all the time. You shouldn't be paying attention to what the guys on the PG Tour are playing. Don't do it. It's not good. Yeah, I think you can make some ex- exceptions. And, Peter Malnati is an exception. Peter Mal- Peter Malnati is an exception. Hell yeah. I, I'm you know he's playing TX flex shafts in his clubs. Don't think you're going to see a lot of a lot of 15 handicaps out uh, out at your local club playing TX flex shafts. But I do love. I do love the fact that he's still playing a hybrid. You know, we, as we as we discussed last week on the podcast, looking at usage trends over the last fifteen years on the DP World Tour. You know, you've seen you've seen hybrids start to dip, and utility irons start to see an uptick. But man, I think it was I think it was Gene who actually pointed this out. Like hybrids, hybrids are a great club. If you're just if you're just a regular golfer like that, that's a really good club. Unless you're a high swing speed guy that just spins the heck out of it, it's sometimes a little bit more difficult to find to find a suitable hybrid. There are some out there. Some of the older ones are actually pretty darn good. But I love the fact that he still has the hybrid in the bag, and I love that he's playing just a like a full on mix set with with all the different models in there. Like that's. That's exactly what I think golfers should be looking at because, you know, if you, if you go back even, even like 10 years, it, it still seemed like the manufacturers were creating sets and they were creating sets in a silo. So, so you had your iron set and that was that. Now, if you look at all the manufacturers out there, they are all creating iron sets and you can buy it just like it is. But if you want to start toying around with like, where do I break the set up? Do I break it up at the five or the six or maybe the seven? Um, do I add three different models in there? Like they're, they're making it so all those models blend together. And, 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 that's, and that's from like a gapping standpoint, which is the most important thing. That used to be the most difficult part was trying to find the, the correct gapping between a couple of different models within a, within a brand. That is not a thing anymore. And I love that. I love the fact that you can go in and just like mix and match. It's like going in and out. Like you can, you can, they, they've got secret custom menus. <laughs> you could, you could, you could create whatever the hell you want and they're going to work. They're going to work great together. Um, looking at like the Betonardi irons as an example, the, the, the two, the two iron models that they just came out with here this, this week that RB wrote about uh, a new blade and a new cavity back. You know, those things are designed to be, to be used as a as a split set mix set, however you want to call it, and then you can use them as as they are. But again, I, I do love these things about Mal- Malnati's bag, and I think they they are they're actually things that that a regular golfer could learn from. Shout out to to Nelly Corda and her like twenty six degree five hybrid <laughs> that's still in her bag. Um, she goes um, three wood, seven wood. 20, 26 degree five hybrid. Every, all the clubs in her bag are tailor made except for her ping hybrid, which is the 26 degree G25, G425, sorry. And then she has a Vokey lob wedge and, or, and sorry, the putter. But like her, she's got a combo set too. She uses the MCs and a 775 iron, I believe it is. So again, it's, it's an example of like use what works because you'd look at a, a five hybrid and a seven wood and you're like, okay, well, like the lofts are fine. And then to be, fair that like this the what is it the uh six the five iron is probably 28 degrees so it's only like a couple degrees weaker than the six hybrid but you know like they spin different they have a different launch profile it just goes to show you put in your bag what works that's what it comes down to for every golfer is get something in your bag that works and you know worry about the score don't worry about anything else yeah I love it. Some good food for thought. All right. Unless Uncle Gene has anything to add on um, Mal Nadi's bag, and I, I'm going to assume that he does not. That would be a negative. <laughs> that would be a negative. I've I've gotten to gotten to know Uncle Gene when he's quiet and when he's just like get on to the next damn topic, boys. Um, so why don't why don't we do that? Let's get on to. It's been a, been a few weeks since we've done a, a proper fully equipped hotline. So let's do one. 
As always, if you want to leave us a voicemail, we will get to your questions on the hotline. The number is 602-935-4974. Again, that is 602-935-4974. Coach has the questions. We don't know what's coming. Coach? As always, a lot of these are directed towards Chris, and since he's not joining, I had to find uh, – Chris <laughs> Chris is MIA. Some, some other uh, ones here. This first one is about a, a recent manufacturing pairing and who's running the show. Hey, guys. Rob Lutz from the Bay Area again. Just wanted to talk Olsen Manufacturing. Uh, at TaylorMade, now that they're a partner together, is he officially the guy, uh, or are they still in the proof of concept type of phase, kind of how like JP, Wedges, and Titleist uh, got together, but that ended up not taking off. Uh, and if he is the guy, has he started working on mallets or has the spider line cemented itself and is here to stay? Thanks, guys. Love this question. It's a good Arby's, one. Arby's not in his head, so he wants me. He wants me to take it. Or are you going to take it? <laughs> you can take. You go. You go first, and I'll see. I'll I'll follow up. Yeah, I I think that this is still very early days. You know, uh, going from being the founder of of your own putter company to linking up with TaylorMade is a massive jump. Um, having met Logan out on tour, RB spent some time with it as well. He's a super nice guy, uh, but he's still just trying to like figure it out. He's working with tour pros. He's he's built putters for. Um, now you've seen uh, putters for Colin Morikawa. Scotty Scheffler won in his very first event at the Hero. Nelly Korda played the putter for a hot minute. So there were some big names already giving his putters a look. But yeah, I don't I don't think that we're anywhere close to a point where where he's going to assume the throne as like the putter guy for TaylorMade. Uh, look, Spider's having a moment again. And Scotty Scheffler is the man behind that. I just wrote a nearly 2000 word <laughs> feature on Scotty's switch to the Spider and and what went what went on behind the scenes. And I think Anytime that somebody starts getting hot with a putter out on tour, it's natural for other guys to start to wonder what's going on. And I think you're going to start to see other other pros that haven't already start to give Spider a look because Scotty's having some success with it. So, yeah, I, I don't think that TaylorMade's in, in a hurry whatsoever to 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 make Logan the face of, of, their, of their putter division. But I think they like having him on board and I think that's the pros that have worked with him have enjoyed that time. So yeah, it's still very early days, and and I don't think that there's anything definitive that we can that we can lend to that question at this moment, other than to say I, I think it's going in a good direction so far, and, and Taylor Mates happy to be working with him. I think it comes down to and. Gene probably can speak to this better than almost anybody because of like, you know, how he works with different companies. But the thing that is hard to believe, and I, and I think you have to think about the way things work backwards is before something gets to a, like on the shelf as a product, it was probably done 10 to 12 months ago. It was finalized. And to get to that point, it had to be worked on years beforehand to figure out manufacturing and potentially change manufacturing techniques. And it's the same like when we find digging around patents on online, you see all kinds of weird stuff and you'll like, these are years and years out. Like what I always think, and I, I realize a lot of OEMs separate this. There's like, there's the, there's the innovation team, then there's the R and D team, and then there's the manufacturing side of things. And the innovation team, they are like throwing stuff at the wall. They are given obviously not like a free reign of budget, but like they can kind of like, don't worry about what we can manufacture now. Let's see if we can figure out how to manufacture something different in the future. And that takes years of development. And it's no different than saying that in the market right now, there's the Tour Reserve putter, which came out just last year. And there's the Spider, which has gone through revisions, but it continues to be something that is obviously a very, very solid product and almost lives on a brand on its own. Everyone knows the TaylorMade Spider, but people just look at it and say, that is a Spider putter, right? So to think that they've got TP Reserve, still a putter and a product out there, which means, and with test, uh, Spider's momentum, they have the opportunity to just say like, we are going to continue to push 
this spider. It's working. It's got momentum. It's rolling. We have inventory of this other putter that is a mill putter. Let's focus at the very, very high level of the pyramid with tour players and then just kind of work our way to a point where if, you know, look on Logan's website, it says like the privacy policies, like customer service directs to TaylorMade. Like it's no hidden secret, right? It's all. Yeah, it's cats out of the bag. Yeah. So like to get from that point to like, let's work with tour players. Let's find what shapes work. Let's work on materials. Let's work on these different things and all of these manufacturing techniques that come out of a single shop in Northern California to let's see what we can do to ramp this kind of stuff up. Takes a lot of time. And I don't think you're going to see anything soon, but I think the way that this relationship has, they, they, everyone seems really happy with it. Everyone, like, you know, they're making new stuff for tour players. Collins putters is, is the next great example. So I think it's going to be a little while, but you know, at some point I think we'll, we'll see something that is, is more of a grander scale than anything else. There you go. Gene knows a lot on Logan Olson. He's just not, he's just not willing to <laughs> divulge anything. No, I think, I think, I think you guys, you guys, you guys are on the front line of it with the tour and that's just it. They hired him to keep tour players happy and to RB's point. Yeah. I mean, you know, back to like the Chrome tour golf ball, you know, that was in development three or four years ago, you know, to, to, to get to this point. I mean, it's just crazy. The timelines and it's crazy you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown of these top R and D guys because they're making a bet and they don't know where the industry's going necessarily. Now, the the fortunate part is they're big enough that they can kind of move the direction. But you know, classic example, I think we were talking about either last pot or a few ones back was Callaway didn't chase adjustable weights when TaylorMade came out with them. And it really set them back big time because of that. So you have to, you really have to be like secure in your knowledge and confident going forward. And I think, I think while he looks promising, it's, it's new in the relationship. And so therefore I, I think they're being cautious and rightly so because, um, I, I think there's a lot more weight on designers now. Like, you know, Scotty was the first one, but you know, I, you know, I worked with Bob Vokey years before he was Bob Vokey and, you know, Titleist came to Bob and said, we're going to make you the wedge guy. And there was like a, a real devotion of resources in order to do that. And they've created an, a, you know, an entire kind of, uh, section of their hard equipment based on Bob Bokey and the wedges. And I, 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 I think before you make that investment, you really want to make sure that this person is the right fit. So while they're, you know, being cautious, I, I, I think that's a smart move in, in, in the short term and you, and you got the guy in the stable. So if he, you know, continues to perform, continues to please tour players and continues to grow, then you nurture him and grow along with it as well. I know I'm sitting here with a stupid smile on my face because all I can think of is the way Gene framed it is like, look, it's like two people just started dating, okay? They like each other. They're really getting along. You know, maybe they've moved in together. Who knows? But there's – and like all their friends know, all their close friends know that they're dating. But like they haven't really gone home and met the parents yet, right? And then once you meet the parents, then you got to meet the extended family. Well, you know, right now this relationship is still at the like, look, we're pretty close here now, guys. Let's move in together. But like let's keep moving it slow. And then eventually we'll meet all the in-laws and all that stuff and, you know, announce the marriage and send out our RSVPs and do all of those things. But right now we're just still at that stage where we just moved in. We're all just figuring out who's picking up what laundry, who's cooking what meals on what days making sure those socks don't land up on the floor. That's where we're at. And I think, you know, eventually we're going to get our RSVP. We're going to get the marriage certificate all lined up and then everyone's going to be there and it's all going to be this big announcement. But, you know, we got to wait. Or, we gotta, I'm, I'm well past that. I got two kids. I'm married for or, almost a decade, this, I think it's this year. So, like, you know, that's <laughs> that's how I started framing it. Or if it doesn't work, you get the quickie annulment in Vegas. So there's that. So. <laughs> Oh Lord! All right, Coach, get get to number two, please. We should get to another question really quick. <laughs> or do we just want to stop at number one? <laughs> let's let's keep rolling. 
Well, well, I love the I love the way RB phrased that about having a stupid smile on his face because I was actually going to say that I think this next question is going to put a very big stupid smile on RB's face. Um, oh I'll just I'll, and I'd like to thank the guy. He mentioned he might go over the limit. You did not go over the minute. Thank you, RB. You enjoy this one. Hi, uh, my name is Andy Wazicek, uh out of Lake Mills, Wisconsin. Uh, this might go over the allotted uh, one-minute message, so please bear with me. Um, so I work for the public schools here in Wisconsin. I got about ten years left uh, before I can retire. Uh, and I recently started my own little uh, in my garage, mainly doing grips and some stamping at this point. Uh, big club uh, person like yourselves, and just wondering what advice you have for somebody who's uh, just starting out in the club uh, building repair and customization business. Uh, Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. And that'll do it for me. Uh, Have a good night. (laughs) And and Gene and Gene too. (laughs) Take it, take it away. Exactly. Take it away. RB. Well, as a tease, since I know that this will also be on the fully equipped YouTube page as well, stay tuned. Uh, recently just filmed a whole bunch of videos, kind of stacked them up um, at home here in my build shop. They're kind of starting to go through the editing process. So make sure you stay and lock into the YouTube page. If you haven't, subscribe, do the whole bit, give us the likes, the whole thing, right? I got to say that stuff. Um, but I do genuinely mean it because the reason video is so helpful is because you get to really kind of go long form and talk about these things. And there we kind of I do dive into a lot of the stuff that I do in my own shop. One of the things, if you are investing into club building, even if it's just for yourself, buy the best tools you possibly can. It doesn't mean that you have to buy the, the, the most expensive. Buy the best ones that you can afford or save it for the one that you know is like the next level that's really going to help with, say, it's a, being a precision instrument like a Lilac machine. Because all of those things allow you to continue to work up and more precise, more precision that you have with your tools. The, the better and easier and faster it is to work on clubs. It's, I mean, from a volume perspective, you're probably not focusing on a lot of volume, but from just starting out, go out and buy a bunch of used clubs, pull them apart, put them back together, buy stuff you've never pulled apart before. Again, go a couple of years back, buy like a single club, buy demo clubs, buy whatever you got to do, start pulling them apart and putting them back together. And that is the quickest and fastest and easiest way to learn and from there, what you're going to do is you're going to build a base knowledge, foundation of knowledge for doing, oh, I've never reshafted a, as an example, I can remember the first time I reshafted a Callaway X2 hot fairywood and the hosel diameter is a little bit bigger at the top than it is at the bottom. They use a very pretty large collared ferrule at the time. And I had to figure out basically the first time I saw this, I was like, okay, well, I have to figure out exactly like what kind of shim I need to use, what ferrule I need to use. Well, by the next time I did the next two or three, like it became second nature. Grab this part, grab this part, need that part. Boom, club gets put together and it's like completely second nature. And that's why you have to go out and look for different things to really kind of test and, you know, build your base knowledge of problem solving. Because I always say like building clubs or even being on the golf course, you're, you're just problem solving, whatever the problem is in front of you. So, Buy the best tools you possibly can. Make sure you're safe. Use ventilation. Wear gloves. Do the whole bit. Uh, have a space where you know that you're not breathing in all kinds of junk if you are cutting a lot of graphite. or And use grip solvent. Don't use gasoline or some other thing that you got to breathe in. I've seen people walk out of grip old closets, basically, after gripping clubs with gasoline. And they look like their their eyes are half sideways. Uh, and you wonder why the grips aren't on straight. Um, so just think about what goes into a club and then slowly build up your repertoire of tools. Those tools will last you a really long time if you buy good stuff and you take care of it and then just continue to work on clubs, not other people's don't take other people's on. I get this. I get this question sometimes and people will be like, well, I want to start this business and I'll take clubs on. It's like, you do not take clubs on until you know 100% every single time that you can deliver a product to somebody because what that does is it creates a really bad reputation for people like, like just yourself and it puts a myth, puts a mistrust into other people that build golf clubs as well. So learn to do things on your own, learn to do stuff with yourself, and then learn to do the finishing work, like turning those ferrules, getting those grips on straight, cutting lengths properly, because the the more confidence you have in, in doing that for yourself, the more you're going to have it for other people. And then, you know, you're just going to continue to grow from there. And at some point, if you're really good at it, you're going to be so busy that you're, you're not going to do it yourself. 
Uh, that's a great answer. And he's the only one who actually knows what the hell he's talking about. So listen to Arby. All right. And pay attention well, to that YouTube channel. I'm telling you, we got all kinds of videos coming. There's there's so true. much content coming. Yeah, there is so much. I, I saw the list of topics. It's going to be a lot of fun. Excited to see RB's content start to come to life on, on golf.com and on the social handles because he, he has a wealth of knowledge. And there's a lot of stuff that we've been wanting to cover. And finally, we're going to get a chance to, to let RB rip and cover it all. So be on the lookout for that on the social handles on the YouTube page. And with that, let's close out episode 234 fully equipped. As I mentioned, yes, the social handles. If you aren't following the podcast on the YouTube page, man, what are you doing? If you're, if you've really gotten this far into episode 234, please like, and subscribe. That's all we ask. We, we don't ask for much. And oh, by the way, we usually do try to, to offer up free stuff from time to time. So we'll make it worth your while. It is at Fluke of Golf on YouTube and at Fluke of Golf on Instagram and at for Fully Underscore Equipped on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.